welcome to the last lecture on having fun with weak convergence. So we have some hard work to do and then we have some fun stuff to do. The hard work is to show the theorem we stated last time and that is to prove that whenever you have a bounded sequence in a reflexive space then this thing has a weakly convergent subsequence. Or rather what we're going to do is prove this in Hilbert spaces because the general proof for just reflexive Banach spaces just goes beyond that course. We don't have time nor the tools for that. And then later we will use that to actually prove that functionals, non-linear functionals on infinite dimensional spaces achieve their maxima and minima if they are nice. And so that's the plan for today. So let's start with this one and let's just get started with the proof of the theorem in case of a Hilbert space. So basically we want to cheat a little bit and not prove it in full generality, but we don't want to cheat too much. Cheating too much would be to take a separable Hilbert space. Then we can actually work, make it quite a bit quicker. You can go through the proof afterwards to see whether you understood everything. If you had a separable Hilbert space, I would start with let's take a countable then subset and let's just talk about inner products with these elements and then we get done quite quickly with the diagonal sequence argument. Here we have to be a bit more careful. So let's just start with the object we want. So let's take Xn be a sequence in X, X Hilbert, such that the norms of Xn are all less than or equal to one. And let me introduce a little bit of notation. So let me just set S to be all of these elements, Xn and in N. And now I do a two-step or three-step procedure. I first make the case that I want to use some kind of countability to get some kind of convergent subsequence. The only way I can get convergent subsequences is usually a diagonal sequence argument. To get something countable, if my space was countable, I would use just a dense set, which is countable. Here I'm saying, well, that's not the case, but I have a sequence. And the sequence gives me a corresponding set, which is countable. So my first claim is I can make a subsequence converge whenever I test with elements in here. Then I go off and say in the next step, this still holds true if I take linear combinations of that, if I take linear combinations and the closure of that, and then I make an extra argument, oh, in the orthogonal complement, life is really good anyway, because everything is zero, and zero converges quite well. And then finally, in the last step, I talk about what has this now got to do with weak convergence. So let's start at the very beginning, and that's with claim one, that is, there exists a subsequence x and j, such that whenever I test x and j with one of those guys, x, k, this converges. And this converges for all fixed k. In so converges as j goes to infinity to something. I don't know yet what that something is. Okay, so to prove something like that, there's really only one way to go. And that's with a really nice diagonal sequence argument. So we construct our usual list of subsequences and then in the end we pass to a diagonal sequence. So let's start with the first sequence. So let n0j just be j. So xnj0 is just the original xj. And then suppose we have chosen um, the x, n, j, um, m maybe for some m. So on, starting with zero. And we have chosen that so that life is good for all the k's which are less than or equal to m. That's always the same for a diagonal sequence argument, i.e. in our situation we want the x, n, j, m 
with xk this converges for all the k less than or equal to i. And then we get the next one, we choose subsequence, so the x and j, we got m, so it's m plus 1 now, of the previous subsequence, yeah, x and j m. So having a subsequence step will be preserved. So we can say so that additionally we have one more property. So also this thing converges when I test with x m plus 1, n j m plus 1, x m plus 1 converges. And this is possible These are simply scalar here. We take inner product, so these are simple scalar functions. So it's possible by bolzano weierstrass as the sequences here, they're actually bounded. So we have x and j, uh, the previous one, uh, subsequence, so that was m, together with xk. So these are certainly bounded by Cauchy-Schwarz, by the norms of these things. And both of these norms are 1, or less than or equal to 1, so that's less than or equal to 1. So we have a bounded sequence of scalars, we pass to a subsequence, we're happy. And now we do this our usual infinitely many times, each time the subsequence gets a bit better, and then we take finally the diagonal sequence so that we still get infinitely many elements. So finally define the x and j that I want to be the j's element of the j subsequence, so x and j, j, and get the claim. So this is the completely typical diagonal sequence argument. There's really no other way that you could try to find these things in a no other sensible way, let's say it like that. Okay, so we have the first claim, and let's just keep the, the, the statements here at that board, and let's do the second claim. So my second claim is for this particular subsequence, that's already the right one. I don't have to get even more subsequences, and I can plug in whatever I want on the right hand side, and the inner products just converge. So for this subsequence, I have that x and j, y converges for every single y in x. I'm not yet saying it converges to something nice or something I can write as an inner product with a fixed element. That's going to be the next step. I'm just saying it converges as a sequence of numbers again. So how do we prove that? So proof of claim two. So let's first do the obvious stuff. So this is okay for y in s by the previous claim. Therefore, by linearity, it's okay for y in the span of s. And this means by density, it's going to be okay for y in the closure of the span of s. That's a bit wobbly. Let's explain exactly. Well, since for such a y, and for every epsilon positive, well, now you have the problem of, I don't actually have notion of limits or something like that, so I don't really know what the corresponding things should converge to. So if you have something that you know should converge, but you don't know what, what it should converge to, there's only one person that comes to help you, and that's Cauchy. 
So you're proving that thing is a Cauchy sequence when you put y in there. And of course, we don't want to prove a certain thing goes to zero when we have a density argument, but we show that the corresponding expression is less than epsilon for every epsilon positive. And so for all epsilon, for such a y, there exists a nice um, y twiddle from the previous case in the span of S so that the norm of y minus y twiddle less than epsilon and hence I go for a limb soup n and m to infinity so that gives me something less than uh, less than epsilon so limb soup and what I want is the corresponding I sh really shouldn't take n or m let's do j and j twiddle yep uh, so I want x and j minus x and j twiddle tested against y that should please be small so I'm bounding that by putting in plus y twiddle minus y twiddle so I bound this with a limb soup of the whole thing with y twiddle x and j minus x and j twiddle y twiddle and still j and j twiddle going to infinity and then I have an extra bit the extra bit has these guys in there and it has a y minus y twiddle so this is going to be small anyway so I do a less than or equal hence I have lim soup of the norms x and j minus x and j twiddle and then I just do times y minus y twiddle which is less than epsilon so that's less than epsilon that thing is less than 2 and the first bit is the nice one so this bit here goes to 0 as the corresponding thing x and j y twiddle convergent so we use something as convergent, so Cauchy, to get that limb soup, the big one, to vanish. And then we're just left with a few epsilons. So this is less than 2 epsilon. And this holds for all epsilon positive. So I get that x and j with my more general y now in the closure of the span. This is Cauchy. So as the field is R respectively C is complete. So this has nothing to do with completeness of the space. Haven't used that. But as our field is complete, that thing is converged. So, so far, nothing used yet about the space, except, of course, that it's an inner product space. Okay, so that's having the ones which have to do with S, essentially. So we are now okay when we're in the span of S. And now we want to say that all of the other guys are completely harmless. Because they are orthogonal to everything that we want to plug in. So that will be fine. So also, for all Y which are in the orthogonal complement of my, uh, of my span, Now we use, we're in a Hilbert space, we have nice orthogonal complements, we can write it. The thing is a sum of them. For all of those, well, we have that xj, or well, whatever, xn, y is zero for every single n out there. So certainly also for the special subsequence, x and j, y is zero, and zero usually converges to zero when j goes to infinity, unless something goes really badly wrong. So this converges to zero. In particular, it's converging to something. I don't even care what it is, and we're OK. So therefore, so claim 2 holds. So for this subsequence, converges for all y. And really, the reason is since it converges for all y in the span, by the previous claim and for all y in the span complement. So as x is the direct sum of both of them, it converges for all of them.
okay, now we're nearly done. The only thing we need is that this thing can be written as inner product with respect, the limit of this thing can be written as inner product with respect to a fixed object. So finally, claim three. There exists an x, which is going to be our weak limit in x, such that the limit of x and j, um, y, is x, y, for every single y, x. And let's just add x and j converges weakly to x. This is basically equivalent and the place where we get the x from and the place where we get the decent weak convergence is the same, is both times the same thing and that's we talk about weak convergence so we talk about elements of the dual space but here we talk about inner products so we relate the things with Ries representation theorem. So let's finally prove this. So proof well, first of all, I need to get my hands on an x before I do anything else. To get my hands on an x, I need a functional to which I can uh, apply Ries. So let's look at the functional that just considers this limit here. And so what do we want to say? Well, in this situation, and we have to be slightly careful here that we don't get our, get a mess with the complex conjugates depending on what I'm looking at. So let me note that y maps to lim limit and now I'm flipping it around just so I get linearity x and j. This limit j goes to infinity is well defined and linear. So let's name this as t. So that's okay well-defined and linear, and of course, if I look at the norm of ty, then this is bounded by the norm of y times the supremum of the norms of the x and j. Or the limit of whatever. The limit of these norms might not exist, so I just go with supremum. So that's less than or equal norm y. So t is certainly a bounded linear operator. So t goes from my space x, this guy is in the field, therefore t is an element of the dual space. So by Ries, there is a unique x in x, so that this limit is given by the corresponding inner product. So ty is equal yx, and now I flip things across just because I like it better the other way. So I can do that or I can leave it as a so, or equivalently. I have x y is equal to the limit. x and j y for all y. And now we have a final thing we have to do finally say that this gives me weak convergence. So this implies that x and j goes to we weakly to x since for all L in x star, now we want to test with x and j and so there exists a maybe set in x so that I can write L or maybe let's keep this just as y because we had y all the times such that I can write L applied to any set as set applied to y for every set that I plug in and so in particular if I plug in the x and j's that's giving me the right thing so what I get is that the limit of L x and j is inner product, that's why I wanted to flip it across again, x and j with this y, which we've seen is x with this y, which again by the definition 
is L applied to X. And that's exactly what we need for our weak convergence. So the key point was we have a sequence. A sequence makes things countable with respect to the important things we have to test with. And here we really use the Hilbert space property because basically you turn elements of your space into the right functionals to test against and then say all our functionals are just harmless, everything is good. And then we get things we are basically just from a diagonal sequence argument. Okay, so that was the hard work. Now let's come to the fun part. And let's come to a key application of this whole concept of weak, comp um, weak compactness. So the key application is the following theorem. So this is a sort of funny theorem corresponding to this course in that it's not in the lecture notes and I don't expect you to learn all the assumptions by heart because that's just annoying. But you definitely need to know how to prove it because the proof of that is just the proof of standard way of getting minimizers. Whether you have it in a very specific situation where you want objects with minimal distance for something very general, some very general energy functionals, it's always the same argument. And so in the printed lecture notes you will find the argument with the basically same amount of detail needed of the proof for a very special case. And here we're just going to do the general case. So this is theorem 13 and this is really the, it works with a direct method of calculus of variations. And I guess most of you, at least in first year, when you heard method, you wouldn't have expected a result which is quite as abstract as that one. But it's, it's coming from a just very basic idea. If I want a minimizer of a functional, I follow a sequence which gives the functional smaller and smaller and smaller, hope the thing converges, and then I'm happy. So that's what we're stating now. And the right assumptions, the right framework for this is exactly reflexive Hilbert spaces. So let's assume we have X is a reflexive Hilbert spaces, space. Uh, sorry, reflexive Banach space. Reflexive Hilbert space is a bit too much because Hilbert spaces are, of course, reflexive. So, so let's X reflexive Banach space. Then we want a nice set nice with respect to weak convergence, but still really general that you can just check it very easily that it satisfies this property. So we go for the geometric property of set is compact, uh, convex and closed. So that gives us the weak compactness. So let's take K being in X, it should be convex, it should be closed, so strongly closed. And to make life interesting, let's not take the empty set. Otherwise, I'm not sure. Okay, and now we want to say nice functionals on such infinite dimensional sets achieve their max or their min. I go for minimizing because in life, as in physics or anything else, you usually want to minimize energy, cost, whatever. So you usually go for minimizers. So let's this and let's take an energy, just a function which goes from k into the reals and this thing has to have two properties so I basically want to say that if my function if my elements in k become really really large there's no chance that they are minimizer and that's called coercivity so what we ask is that if xn shoots off to infinity then please functional e of xn also go off to infinity so that's called coercive. coercivity. And then the second part is we need some kind of continuity. And basically what we want is the candidate for a minimizer we will get with weak convergence. And we don't want that the weak limit suddenly has a lot more energy than we had before. So we don't care whether the function is completely continuous, but it should be semi-continuous, as in continuous 
in one direction. So we're asking that if xn goes weakly to x, then I'm guaranteed that e of x is less than or equal to the limit of e of x. Now you know here in Oxford everything has a three-letter abbreviation for any nice theorem, any nice property, maybe even less. That one has a five-letter abbreviation. So this is S V O L S C S W L S C or for really what it is, it is sequential weak lower semi continuous. Which is a fun way of saying the thing I care about in terms of convergence is I ask for weak convergence of sequences. I'm not asking about continuity definitions with open and closed sets. We didn't even define what that means for our spaces here. And then I don't care whether it's fully continuous. So I'm not asking that the limit of the function is equal to the function of the limit. I'm just asking for that it can drop down only lower, therefore lower semi-continuous. So that's the right condition. And now if all of these things are satisfied, and I guess you see why I don't even want you to learn stuff like that by heart, that's really not necessary. If we have these things, then E is bounded from below and achieves its minimum. So the conclusion, then E is bounded from below. and achieves its minimum in K. And you know that from school, if something is a minimum, then usually that means derivative is equal to zero. So often you use these kinds of functionals to say, I actually want to solve an equation. And that equation can be written as derivative of a functional on a Hilbert space equals zero. For example, Laplacian of u equals zero can be thought of derivative of a function equals zero. And the way I prove this is by checking these things with a bit of functional analysis and then being happy that things exist. Okay, so let's do first an application of that, of just a simple functional where all of these things are satisfied and then let's give the proof, which is, yeah, not a lot of, maybe five, six lines, but basically just gives you all of the nice things again that we've seen this, in this chapter. So first immediate corollary of this I'm not numbering anymore. Oops, 14, right? So let's assume the same things for the set so that we can apply it. So reflexive Banach space and all of this. So let K be a closed convex set not empty of a reflexive Banach space. Then, for every single set in X, Banach space X, there exists a nearest object in K. So there's a K set that minimizes in, in K with minimal distance. i.e. so that norm set minus the nearest object k set is equal to the distance of set to the to the set k which by definition is the infimum over the set of norm set minus any x that lives in there. So that's our statement. Let me recall that you proved a very, very similar statement in functional analysis one. 
And the main change there was K a closed set convex in a Hilbert space, not reflexive Banach space. And there was one more change there. And that change was exclamation mark here. There's a unique guy which minimizes. And so if you're in a Hilbert space, then you have uniqueness because the basic picture is just here's a convex set, here's a point, closest guy, meets orthogonal, anything else is further away. If you're in a Banach space, that's not true anymore. So the simplest example, if you're in a Banach space, you can, for example, that's also a pretty nice convex set. And you can, for example, take R2 with the infinity norm. So it's just the max of the corresponding uh, x1, x2s. And now if I go quite far away, maybe go here, then the corresponding maximal component to anything here is always going to be the y component. So therefore, every single point here, every one of these vectors, even though it really looks wrong, but all these vectors have exactly the same length if I take them in the L infinity norm. So the whole line here is going to be my set of minimizers with minimal distance. So basically, whenever you're not in a Hilbert space, don't expect anything to be unique. Well, weak limits, yes. Minimizers, no. OK, so let's quickly prove that theorem implies corollary. And then let's afterwards prove uh, the theorem. And actually, taken together, their proof is about the same length as the proof of the corollary that you find directly in the lecture notes. So how does the theorem imply the corollary? And that's really just to sort of get used to these funny assumptions. So of course, f reflexive Banach space, part of the assumption, k close convex set, non-empty, part of the assumptions. So all we have to check is coercivity and weak lower semi-continuity, but that's quite easy. So if norm of xn goes to infinity, well then also norm of xn minus set goes to infinity because it's bounded from below by triangle with xn minus norm set. Norm set is fixed, life is good. So my functional is just going to be the thing I want to minimize. So let E of x be norm x minus z. So coercive is OK. And then finally, if xn weakly to x, then subtracting a fixed element doesn't really bother that thing. So xn Oops. Minus set certainly also converges weakly to x minus set. And so one of the important things we've seen is weak convergence doesn't increase norm. So what that really means is the norm is a, your typical example of a sequentially weak lower semi-continuous function. That's exactly the type of thing we have. So I have the norm of x minus set less than or equal to the minth of the norm of xn minus z. And so second bit is also OK. And therefore, we're done. So having the general statement just gives me all these things for free if I check some very simple assumptions. So now to convince you that also proving the theorem is actually pretty quick, it's just using each assumption once and basically then be fine. So the proof of the theorem So what do we want? We want the minimizer. So the sequence to take is a minimizing sequence. So choose any minimizing sequence i.e. any xn in k, so that the energy at xn goes to the infimum 
of the energy where this might be minus infinity if unbounded or not bounded below or otherwise just an element of the real. I don't know at this point where it's bounded below. I don't want to prove that separately. I'm just going to get it for free once I have a minimizer. So having this minimizing sequence, we can now say, well, this minimizing sequence is nice, as in it doesn't shoot off to infinity. The reason for that is coercivity. So the sequence Xn must be bounded. As otherwise, we'd have a maybe not all of the xn shooting off to infinity, but we'd have a subsequence where xn j goes to infinity and the energy of xn j goes to plus infinity, which is definitely not equal to the infimum. Whatever the infimum it is, it's certainly not plus infinity. That's where we don't have an empty set also comes in. And of course, just taking minimizing sequence, it's quite helpful to have a set where we can choose them. So now we have a bounded sequence. We have it in a reflexive Banach space. So now comes weak convergence to get our limit. So S X reflexive. And I mean, I keep saying reflexive Banach space, but to be honest, I mean, any reflexive space is automatically a Banach space because it's isometric to its bi-dual and the bi-dual is always Banach. It's just writing Banach space or norm space is the same amount of work. So let's just do this. So as S is reflexive, hence there exists a subsequence x and j that converges weakly to some x to some x in the first instance just the guy in x. So the x might not be an allowed guy for the e. We might not even be able to evaluate it. That's where the next step comes in and that's we have a closed convex set and therefore that's closed under weak convergence. So again, that was one of the theorems we had. So as k is closed and convex, it's closed under weak convergence. So indeed, this is an admissible guy. X is in k, x, k. So in particular, the energy function of x is greater or equal to the infimum of the energy over the whole thing, just because it's in the set. But of course, it's also less than or equal to the infimum. E of x less than or equal to the limit inf of E of xn. So this is now sequentially weak lower semi-continuity. And this is also the infimum, so we're done. And at the same time, we proved because there is an element which is the infimum, we map into the real, so the infimum is also an element of the reals, so the whole thing is bounded from below. Okay, so that's how direct method of calculus of variations work. In general, life is not quite as easy that you might not be given a functional that you know you have to consider. You might not be given a Banach space that you want to consider, but often the main job of applying this thing is to first put together the right Banach space, to first put together right, the right functional that you can actually analyze. And so, because I'm actually, funnily enough, a bit ahead of schedule of my lectures, so we still have two weeks left after that. The two weeks are just gonna be spectral theory, from next week on. So for that, anyone I would recommend looking at Neumann series again, because we're going to use them quite heavily and all of that next week. But for now we have time, so I do a little off syllabus. 
application. So anyone who just wants to nap off because the weekend is closed, feel free to do that. For everyone else, we do some fun stuff. And we look at my favorite energy, and that's the Dirichlet energy. So what's this application? So let's consider a nice domain. Omega in Rn. And with nice, I don't mean it needs to be something where you can analyze things specifically like a ball, but it shouldn't have weird corners, or at least it should have some nice smooth boundary. So just think of it as any kind of nice blob that you might consider. This is nice. Omega definitely bounded. And now we want to look at a given function. f that is defined on the boundary. And now the question I have, what function u is given by this function f on the boundary and has least possible energy? So what's a reasonable energy to consider when you have functions? Energy has to do usually with something with change. So the simple thing you can think, think of as an energy is change squared integrated up. That's quite reasonable. So that gives you this Dirichlet energy. So the question is, is there a minimizer of the Dirichlet energy? So usually you do a half integral gradient u squared dx over omega. So this is just summing up the partial derivatives with this boundary condition. And that's usually the problem, sort of type of problem you're given. You might be given the functional that you care about, but nobody's going to tell you, here's your Hilbert space, or here's your Banach space. So when you write down the functional, the first thing to consider is, for what functions does that thing even make sense? So we have a gradient, so we would quite like to differentiate. So maybe consider the first thing that comes to mind if I have a derivative, I want one derivative at least. So let's maybe consider functions in, in C1. So let's maybe consider K being the set of all functions U, which are C1 on the set into the reals. So that please U restricted to the boundary is F. Good news. That's pretty convex, right? You have a constraint, which is a very nice linear constraint. If I interpolate between two guys like that, the f just sticks where it is at the boundary, everything is good. So this is certainly convex. You could consider this as a subspace of C1, omega. This will be closed. It's certainly also not empty as long as I make sure my f is nice, so given function, should probably get this smooth, then this should work out. Because I have a nice domain, that should all work out. Okay, so maybe I start with that thing. I have C1. Reasonable thing to take on C1, we would normally say C1 norm, as in function in C1 is the soup of the function plus the soup of the gradient. Quite reasonable. But then you think back to your theorem. Your theorem asks coercivity as one of the main things. Meaning, if my norm shoots off to infinity, this needs to imply that the functional shoots off to infinity. And that just forget about it. I mean, this is so far off, right? I can have the gradient massively large at some points. If I integrate over this, I probably won't even see it. So if I have any kind of function that peaks, that one won't care much. We'll be giving you something nice, finite, that thing will be huge. So basically the C1 norm has absolutely nothing to do with that guy. 
Therefore, you should never consider that problem on that space. Or at least not with that norm. That norm is just completely wrong. So this is the wrong norm for the problem. What's the right norm? The right norm is, well, it should have something to do with that thing up there. That looks quite, quite like a norm. Maybe not quite ideal yet for a norm because the constants would say, well, that gives me a zero. Of course, that might not be ideal. So let's just modify a little bit. So try the right norm. Is taking the integral of just gradient of u squared. That looks much, that looks really Hilberty. We can probably use that. And plug something else on top of it, which is giving you nice Hilbert properties for functions, probably L2. Looks quite reasonable. And we don't want anything stronger. So that looks like a bit weaker, as in normally I can bound the function with the gradient up to, you know, constants. So I don't want to have second derivatives in there because I would again have a problem if second derivatives shoot off to infinity, but first derivatives remain bounded, no chance of coercivity. So that's sort of the right object. And that thing has a nice name. This is called the H1 norm. And this is the next guy of the L2 norm. So you start L2, then you go H1, then you go H2, H3, and so on. And so that's my thing. So this is a good norm for our object. The good news is now we have the coercivity settled. At least you can get it settled. You need to prove things, but one can actually show that with respect to this norm, the functional is coercive. So fact, and this is quite an involved but quite fun argument, uses Fubini and fundamental theorem of calculus, is that E is coercive on k when I put the, this norm on the board. So one important property I've done. Now, of course, that's a, H1, a C1 space. That's the wrong norm on a C1 space. And normally, you would say if you have a space, just go and change your norm to the right thing. That's the, what we don't want to do. So we said we want to change the norm to the right thing. What do you do if you have a space where you want to keep the norm, but you want to have a Banach space? Take a closure, take a completion. So one of the topics you saw in functional analysis, one is completion. And so the problem at this point is that C1 of omega, with this funny H1 norm is not complete. So therefore we replace by completion. And you can guess twice what we call the completion, H1 of course. So H1 is the completion of, for example, C1 completing with respect to H1. And now we have a Banach space. Even better, that thing, just the way we des described it, gives me a Hilbert space. So this thing is a Hilbert space. And now you can actually go off and show that this thing is also having the right weak, sem weak lower semi-continuity. So that comes Again, together, I like this application because it brings together so many of the concepts you've seen like over the year with completion and, and weak convergence and all of that, Hilbert spaces, and now finally also compactness. So let me make another remark about the fact. So H1 is actually the functions F in L2, such that for those of you who go to distribution theory, the distributional derivative is in L2. And importantly, that's one fact, the inclusion map 
from H1 into L2 is that guy has more regularity, it has control on derivatives, and that thing, when you go down, you ask for less, and that's a typical thing where you get compactness. So F goes to F, this is actually compact. So that's the same with, we've seen C1 is compactly embedded in C0, H1 is compactly embedded in H0, which is sort of L2. And then the consequence of this is if Xn goes weakly to X in this new space, then this actually implies that Xn minus X in the weaker norm goes to zero. And that implies that weak lower semi-continuity is just the property of the norm. So what we get is that if I look at the energy of Xn, or let's say the energy of X, so this is a half of gradient U, uh, X, sorry, X is a really bad notation, let me go U. So U, grad U L2 squared, and I plug in a UL2 squared and I take it away again. And then I just take it, separate it out. So I get, what I get is that I have half of the norm plus an extra term that comes from compactness. And when you have compactness, you get in particular that the accents in the weaker norm go to this in the weak one. So I can write, split this up and say, sorry, I'm going a little bit over time. This is the norm of U, the limit in H1, which of course is less than limit of the norm in H1, just by the usual weak lower semi-continuity of the norm. And that guy is just equal to a limit of norms because of strong convergence. And these two things together give me exactly that together this is less than or equal to lim of E of un. And so I have done these things and now I take my, my big theorem, my direct method of calc var, and have absolutely no idea what that function should be, but I get a minimizer. So there exists a minimizer u of e. And if you're computing, minimizer means derivative zero, dd epsilon of epsilon equals zero of energy u plus epsilon phi for phi equals zero on the boundary, then what you get is if it's allowed, is gradient grad u times grad phi. And that's nothing else than minus Laplacian of u times phi, if this is allowed. If u is nice enough, that's what you get. So therefore, what you really get is that u satisfies Laplacian u is zero, u equals f on the boundary, if it's nice enough. And your job, once you have your limit, you can start looking at it. And it turns out such a u is actually a C-infinity function. Once you got it, you can prove that. And for more details on that, see fourth year course on functional analytic method for PDs. So thanks a lot and have a good weekend.